So I'm going to talk about the universe, and in particular, I'm going to talk about planets, galaxies, and the cosmos. So first, planets. So we've now discovered about 3,000 planetary systems besides our own. And uh, before these discoveries, we thought that our own planetary system, the so-called solar system, was typical with small rocky planets near the sun and gas giant planets farther away. It turns out that we have never discovered another planetary system that's anything like ours. Most planetary systems have what we call super-Earths or mini-Neptunes uh, with about two to four times the mass of the Earth. There's no such planet in our system. Some planets are in the habitable zone around their stars, in which water would be mostly in liquid form, but most of those planets are probably not hospitable to advanced forms of life. That's because uh, their stars are small, uh, brown dwarfish kind of stars, which, despite the fact that they're small, they often have violent outbursts. Our own living Earth is quite rare and fragile. Our solar system also seems unusually clean, with relatively little debris and dust compared to other planetary systems. We know that there was a late great bombardment of the inner planets that ended about 750 million years after the solar system formed. It seems likely that there was a gigantic rearrangement of the outer solar system and maybe even the inner solar system that caused many comets to hit the inner planets. The late great bombardment ended about 3.8 billion years ago. Primitive microbial life started on Earth very soon after that. So primitive life may be very common in the universe, at least on planets with liquid water. Many stars have planets in that habitable zone with liquid water, as I mentioned. And that there, there are also moons in the outer solar system with liquid water under their icy surfaces, including Jupiter's moon Europa and Saturn's moon Enceladus. So there's a, a picture of Enceladus, the moon, and there's a close-up of geysers at the south, southern tip of Enceladus viewed from the Cassini spacecraft, which recently was caused to re-enter uh, Saturn and burn up. Maybe we can send spacecraft through those geysers and see if there's anything living, uh, or at least molecules that might have been associated with life. So after the end of the Great Bombardment, when life in a primitive form got started right away, it took another two billion years before cells that had separate nuclei and mitochondria and so forth, uh, so-called eukaryotic cells, developed. And then another over a billion years before complex life, multicellular life, began. Uh, the first complex organisms are only a little over half a billion years ago. Intelligent life and science only arose once on Earth, and so it may be very rare in the universe. New spacecraft may make it possible for us to detect the effects of life on the distant planets, for example, oxygen atmospheres. And we'll also keep searching for intelligent life from signals. And we're building a huge array covering more than a kilometer of just collecting area of radio telescopes called the Square Kilometer Array, being built mostly in Australia and South Africa. So we may actually start to detect signals with that enormous antenna. Moving on to galaxies. So our modern scientific picture says that the solar system is just a very tiny little thing on the scale of our galaxy. It takes light only eight minutes to get from the sun to us, less than a day to cross the entire solar system. But the solar system is, is about 25,000 uh, light years away from the center of the galaxy. In other words, the light from the center of our galaxy takes 25,000 years to get to us. It takes about 100,000 years for light to cross the visible galaxy. Our galaxy is just a little pinprick on the scale of the local supercluster, the nearest collection of about 10,000 big galaxies centered on the Virgo cluster, the biggest concentration of galaxies for 100 million light years around. And the Virgo cluster is just a puny cluster compared to the giant ones and we've been mapping the universe on the scale of many billions of light years. 
Almost all the stars today are in big galaxies like our own Milky Way. Nearby large galaxies are disk galaxies like our galaxy, or else big balls of stars called elliptical galaxies. And I have pictures of a typical big spiral galaxy there on the left and uh, a big elliptical galaxy. And then I have a picture of what galaxies like ours start out looking like. And they look like pickles. They're, they're uh, long and thin, and they don't look anything like nearby galaxies. This is a discovery with Hubble Space Telescope compared to simulations. It turns out our simulations ended up looking just like that, and so now we understand why it happens, and it has to do with the dark matter. So we're just figuring out how galaxies form and evolve, and big ground-based telescopes like our Keck Observatory and the giant telescope that we hope to be able to build in Hawaii starting any month now, that'll be 30 meters across. And two giant 30-meter uh, scale telescopes are, are also planned for Chile. So we'll have a view of the southern sky as well as the northern sky with these giant telescopes. Hubble and other space telescopes are currently operating, and we're going to get a bunch of great new telescopes. Uh, James Webb Space Telescope, for example, uh, scheduled to be launched now in March or April of 2018. Uh, 2019, sorry. Many stars in the very early universe may have been much more massive than our sun, up to 100 or more times the mass of the sun. And the big ones will be in binary star systems with other massive stars. Practically all the massive stars that we've seen are in bi these binary star systems with other massive stars. When these stars ended their lives as supernovas, they became massive black holes. The Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, uh, has thus far detected four mergers of massive black holes. And this confirmed predictions of Einstein general relativity that had never been tested before. We're testing general relativity now, finally, right up to the speed of light. Those stars are going around each other at practically the speed of light before they merge and make a giant black hole. And we've never tested general relativity until now, right up at the speed of light, just about. LIGO also just announced the discovery that happened in August of this year of gravity waves from merging neutron stars. Neutron stars are what happen when smaller but still quite massive stars, supernova, they're not quite massive enough to make black holes, and instead they pack stuff into basically the form of nuclear matter. Uh, and the data from ground-based telescopes show that these events generate huge amounts of very heavy elements like gold and uranium. Uh, the first human to actually see the light from this uh, merging neutron stars was Charlie Kilpatrick, who's a postdoc at UC Santa Cruz, where I'm from. Uh, and he's going to be giving a talk about that at Santa Cruz on Monday. Uh, so this is what the LIGO detector detects. That, that little chirp at the end, which lasts about two-tenths of a second, is actually what they detected just playing it as sound. That's gravity waves. Those gravity waves from the merging neutron stars came from 130 million light years away, and uh, from the merging black holes more than a billion light years away. Onward now to the cosmos. So the picture that's up on the screen is very beautiful. That's the ultra deep field taken by the Advanced Camera for Surveys on Hubble Space Telescope. But it's very misleading because it only shows about half of 1% of what we now know is out there. 99.5% of the universe is invisible. It doesn't shine, it doesn't absorb light, it doesn't reflect light. So, in our books, uh, Nancy and I, the, our next speaker is going to be Nancy Abrams, my wife, we use symbols like this to represent, in this case, the visible matter. So, the lower part of uh, the new order of the universe, that's what the bottom says, Novus Ordo Seclorum, uh, the 13 steps, of course, were supposed to represent the 13 colonies, but we're using them to represent the hydrogen and helium that are about 98% of the mass of the sun. The rest of the sun, about 2%, is all other visible atoms. Oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, iron, etc. 
So the original stars are just made of hydrogen and helium, and then those stars manufacture all the other elements, either as they are fusing or else in the explosive processes at the end of their lives, or in the case of the neutron stars, when they merge. But what about all the rest of the stuff, the other 99.5%? So it turns out that most of the atoms in the universe are not visible. We know they're there by various indirect methods. And almost all the mass in the universe is something completely different. It's not made of atoms, it's not made of the stuff that atoms are made of. It's cold, dark matter. Cold means that it was moving very, very sluggishly in the early universe. And my colleagues and I always use that term, sluggish. That's a call out to the banana slugs, which are our mascot at UC Santa Cruz. <clears throat> so the majority of the density of the universe isn't even matter. It's some mysterious stuff that we call dark energy. Now, we don't know what the dark matter is, and we don't know what the dark energy is, but we know very much how they work. And so we can make detailed theories. Here's another way of thinking about, of looking at, picturing uh, the story. This is an idea that uh, my wife Nancy came up with. Uh, so imagine that the entire universe is an ocean of dark energy. That's that bottom 70%. On that ocean sail billions of ghostly ships made of dark matter. But we don't see the ships and we don't see the ocean. All we see are the beacons the lights on the top of the tallest mass of the biggest ships, those are the galaxies. And again, I'm reminding you that that's half of 1%, the stuff that shines. And of that, only a tiny fraction, about a hundredth of 1% of what's actually out there is heavy elements, the stuff that we're made of. Incidentally, we, you all and I, are about 60-some percent oxygen. That's the most common of the heavy elements, and it's the most common of the heavy elements in our bodies, mostly in the form of water. So this theory is known in the trade as lambda CDM. Lambda was the Greek letter that Einstein used for the dark energy. And cold dark matter is the theory that my colleagues and I developed, which is now the standard cosmological theory. But a friendlier name is the double dark theory, because the theory is based on two invisible or what we call dark things, dark matter and dark energy. So why do we think this is right? Well, the theory made lots of predictions. One of the predictions was that the matter would be distributed according to these pictures, that dashed curve. And we made that prediction before any of the results were available, any of the data came in. And as the data has come in, it has just totally confirmed what we predicted. The theory also predicts the nature of the differences in temperature in different directions in the heat radiation of the Big Bang that surrounds us. And the theory predicted this curve with all those wiggles. And when we made that prediction, there wasn't any data, just that there was cosmic background radiation. Well, the data has now come in. Every one of those red points and the blue points on the lower curves, which are polarization data, every one of those points is an independent measurement. And I hope you'll notice there are no discrepancies. The theory works. So let me show you how the universe evolves under the assumptions of this theory. So the, the drunk is sitting on the stoop and he says, quarks, neutrinos, mesons, all those damn particles you can't see. That's what drove me to drink. But now I can see them. And you're going to see them too. I'm going to show you a visualization uh, using computers uh, of how the dark matter evolves. But I have to remind you that everything you're going to see that's bright is not visible stuff, it's just dark matter. And the brighter it is, the denser is the dark matter. So that's a little piece of expanding universe. And in the center, you can see that things are starting to fall together. And these are making the dark matter lumps that become galaxies that, that host the forming galaxies. Where the dark matter lumps go through each other, the galaxies will collide. So 
Just to recap, first we get this period of expansion. When the universe is about half its present age, about seven billion years, that center part has stopped expanding and everything is falling together. And that's when a big galaxy is forming at the center of this thing. And then today, the universe is divided into small regions that are not expanding. In fact, some of them are still contracting, like our local group where the Andromeda galaxy and our galaxy are coming together to have a giant collision in about four or five billion years. So the universe gets divided into tame space and wild space. Tame space tamed by gravity and wild space where the dark energy is making the universe expand faster and faster. Uh, Nancy, who's going to be speaking next, is the one who coined that terminology, which I think is really great. Outer space just means beyond the Earth's atmosphere, not very interesting. But the real division is between tame space, which isn't expanding with the universe, and wild space, which is causing the tame regions to expand apart. Now, when we run these high-quality computer simulations, the picture we get of an individual galaxy's dark matter looks like these pictures with all those lumps which represent some of the satellite galaxies around us and smaller things that we can't see but we can detect gravitationally. A galaxy, the visible galaxy, remember that 100,000 light years across, is just a tiny little central region, less than a thousandth the volume of the dark matter lump that it's formed in. How does this fit into the really big picture? More or less like this. So that's what the universe looks like on the giant scale of a billion light years. This is from a big simulation that we ran on NASA's biggest supercomputer. It took three months and we used a large part of the whole machine to run it. We subsequently reran it because new data came in and it changed the parameters a bit. So this actually isn't the latest version. It's a version that we ran in uh, 2011. The new version is now published and uh, it looks similar. So let me summarize how we fit into the universe. We're central to the universe, not geographically, but in seven ways that all follow directly from astronomy and physics. As we look out in space, we look back in time because it took longer for the light to reach us from farther away. So we're seeing light that left longer and longer ago. So we're seeing galaxies at an earlier and earlier stage. We're surrounded by spheres of time. As we look out, we're seeing earlier stages of the universe. The finite speed of light makes this inevitable. We're made of the rarest stuff in the universe, stardust, the stuff, the heavy elements that are made in stars the hundredth of one percent of cosmic density. So we're not made of the common stuff. We're very rare and special. We live in the middle of all possible sizes. The smallest size that physics can describe with modern quantum mechanics and relativity is called the Planck length. And it's represented by the tip of that Ouroboros, the snake swallowing its tail symbol. And that's about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. The entire cosmic horizon is 10 to the 29 centimeters. That's how big we can see. We, at about a meter scale, we are right in the middle of all possible size scales. And all intelligence cre intelligent creatures are gonna be roughly that size. If they're too much bigger, it's gonna take too long for signals to cross the, the organism. And so at most, you're going to have a collection of individual organisms. On a small scale, the size of an insect, they're not big enough to have the complex chemistry and physics required for a thinking machine like our brains. So this is the only scale that we would expect to see living, intelligent creatures. We live in a universe that may be a rare bubble of space-time in the infinite seething cauldron of the eternal super-universe. Outside a unique and isolated bubble, which we call the Big Bang, there's neither space nor time as we know it. But here inside, there's time for evolution and history, and there's space across which connections can form and structures can develop. We also live at the midpoint of time, which is the peak moment in the entire evolution of the universe for astronomical observation. The most distant galaxies, which we've just acquired the technological ability to see, 
are beginning to disappear over the cosmic horizon now that the once slowing expansion of the universe has instead begun to accelerate. The universe is expanding faster and faster because of the dark energy. This, of course, is that famous picture that was taken uh, by the, first, the spacecraft with astronauts that first orbited the moon. We live at the midpoint in the life of our planet. It formed along with the sun and the other planets about four and a half billion years ago. It has about six billion years to go before the Earth is roasted when our sun swells into a red giant star. Complex life evolved on Earth about half a billion years ago, as I mentioned earlier, and it has about half a billion years to go until the warming sun overheats the Earth. That's not because of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's because the sun itself gets hotter. However, our distant descendants could easily develop technology to move the Earth further from the sun. We've actually even published articles about exactly how that would be done. <laughs> From the point of view of our species, today is late enough to have evolved our present abilities, while early enough for our descendants to have a multi-billion year potential future. For the generations alive at this moment, it's late enough that we're sobering up to the scale of our problems, but not so late that we've lost all chance to solve them. Today is a pivotal moment that will never come again. And what this graph shows is how the human carbon dioxide contributions to the atmosphere are obviously the cause of this very rapid increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. For the last million years, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere never exceeded 300 parts per million. It's now over 400 parts per million and shooting up very rapidly, and that's mainly because of the Earth, because of the contributions from humans. So, to summarize, our living Earth is rare and fragile, the universe is mostly dark matter and dark energy, invisible things, which no one predicted until the modern universe was actually discovered through the use of our wonderful telescopes on the ground and in space. And humans in the cosmos are central, special, and endangered. Let me just mention that uh, uh, the two books that Nancy and I wrote together are available for sale. And uh, actually, there's a Spanish version of our more recent book, uh, with a website that's entirely in Spanish, as well as the English version, newuniverse.org. And uh, the bookstore actually also has our earlier book, The View from the Center of the Universe. Thanks very much.